All right. Uh, first off, if you would like to follow along or revisit the slides uh, after the conference, they're available at tinyurl.com slash predfict dash dh23. I'm hoping this works. No, it sure doesn't. All right. Um, so we'll start off with some context and motivation. Um, as mentioned, we're uh, looking at machine learning, leveraging machine learning to find items uh, of English language fiction in a large digital library. Uh, looking at the context and the motivation, um, culture analytics, DH research uh, has kind of exploded, especially in the last 10 years. Uh, and this means that large digital libraries have now become objects of computational study, uh, even though they were not designed or built for this purpose. Uh, one such large digital library, perhaps the largest, uh, the Hottie Trust Digital Library, uh, for whom I work, uh, which is part of the reason that's our use case. Uh, this digital library opens all of its 17.7 .7 million volumes to computational analysis, uh, even though only about 40% of the entire corpus is open to read. So uh, this brings up a number of problems. Um, the Hottie Trust Digital Library, the HTDL, is massive. Uh, that makes discovery of any particular subset of items challenging. Uh, digital library metadata in general, but especially Hottie Trust digital library metadata is often missing or incomplete. Uh, even if metadata records are complete, whatever that means, uh, standards have changed over time, meaning that records are inconsistent. So you have to take multiple different types of approaches um, if you're looking at just metadata to find items. And um, the Library of Congress, uh, which is the, the major source of uh, subject information for items in the United States, uh, did not make a distinction really between genre as form or excuse me, fiction as genre and form until the 90s. So we're only looking at you know, 30 years of uh, correctly uh, capturing a genre of an item rather than saying this is a novel, a manuscript. So in an ideal world, this is what our metadata records might look like. Um, this is Mark viewed in the web browser. Uh, you'll see we have, I bet this thing works. Um, although, anyway, too smart for me. Um, but you'll notice that we have a lot of subject information here um, of, for our two volumes, lots of other rich metadata. So if this were the way that we uh, would want things to work, this is how every volume would look. Uh, but the reality is that most volumes do not have, um, it's okay, uh, do not, thank you though, do not have rich metadata records. Uh, only about 60% of all volumes in the HDDL even have subject genre information assigned. And these volumes largely skew toward academic, um, or excuse me, scientific publications, so not so much literature. Um, and uh, though this problem is a problem for all volumes, uh, it's especially worse for uh, literature that is maybe considered non-canonical or non-English. So this is the real world. We have uh, two canonical texts, um, one Spanish uh, LLF and one French, Madame Bovary. Neither has any subject information at all in uh, their mark record. And then we have something that's uh, Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie, not so canonical, but in English, still no uh, uh, genre information at all. So the question is, uh, can we leverage machine learning and predictive modeling to identify items, specifically English language, language fiction, using just the text themselves, so bypassing metadata? And the answer is, it's kind of yes, right? Um, we have uh, a great uh, data set produced by Professor Underwood, Patrick Camutis, and Jessica Witte that was published formally in 2020, the Novelty M data sets for English language fiction. So we are gonna build on this data set, um, and Professor Underwood is going to uh, speak a little bit about that data set right now. Uh, sure. <laughs> so um, this is out there. You can download it from various sources. Um, and uh, well, I've used it a lot. I hope some other people have used it. I hope it's high impact. Um, the, the important thing about the structure of this data set that I want to underline is um, in creating it, the co-authors were aware that there really is no consensus on what we are wanting to represent when we construct a representation of the fiction of the past, or really you know, any set of historical documents. Are we trying to represent things that were widely read? In that case, we might be more interested in books of which there are many volumes preserved. That's one sign of circulation. Or are we interested in literary production? In which case, well, we're really just interested in each title as a title, the fact that it was written is what we're interested in, not how many copies there are or how many people read it. Different approaches, different objects that we're trying to represent. Um, so also, there are different uh, desires for um, accuracy and reliability. Some people really want to know that every volume they're using in their analysis truly is fiction. They need you know, 100% manually corrected 
um, precision. Uh, some people don't need that or they believe that their problem doesn't require that. So that's why the, the, the original data set consisted of many subsets, partly as a rhetorical device to dramatize that we weren't offering a single um, data set as representative, but we were sort of dramatizing that you can slice this in different ways. We have a subset that's manually corrected. It will be smaller. We have a subset that's gender balanced if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to look at that representation, and so on. Um, it's, uh, there's a TSV file that you can download. Um, and you know, the, the limitations of this, we, by looking, by using the manually corrected subset, we were able to estimate precision and recall. So it's pretty precise. We're getting maybe 92, uh, rather 92 or 93% of the volumes, even in our largest not manually corrected sets really are fiction according to the, you know, a human observer. But the recall is not perfect, so we may be missing as many as 14% of the volumes in the library that really are English language fiction. And you know, more fundamentally, the, the underlying library from which we're drawing is not an unbiased or complete record of, of English language fiction by any means. It's drawn mostly from um, US academic libraries, not exclusively, but it's biased toward that. And um, our subset we only were looking at books, not at periodicals, which are, of course, are very important. So there's still a lot of biases and exclusions. Um, and the same will be true for the data set that we developed to update um, this Novelty M data set. So given uh, the success, so the, the relative accuracy of the initial Novelty M data set, this project uh, looked to basically update and improve the process. Uh, so for one, uh, the original Novelty M dataset was generated on a snapshot that ended in 2015. Uh, since then, we've had uh, many millions of items added to the digital library, um, just under 2 million in English language that could be uh, candidate volumes to be fiction. Uh, we also wanted to see, uh, as, as always, if we can improve the process, make it easier, uh, make it better. So the initial data set was, uh, had page level predictions. We instead want to look at the volume level. We think that, for one, a little bit easier. Uh, two, probably a little bit more accurate. Uh, and then just as a kind of a pet project of my own, we wanted to benchmark other statistical models. So the initial uh, data set was generated with log logistic regression. Uh, in this project, we once again uh, look at logistic regression, but also uh, support vector machine and random forest. Uh, additionally, uh, we wanted to create a reproducible pipeline, but also, if I'm being a little bit clever, uh, this was kind of an act in reproducibility. I was a sole coder on this project, and I took uh, the code from Professor Underwood's initial uh, data set and basically tried to get it to work and make sense to my brain, which is certainly not the most advanced programming brain. And then, as always, uh, see what else interesting pops up along the way. So secondary project goals, we don't have to belabor this hopefully for this crowd, but more fiction leads to hopefully more research, more fiction leads to hopefully more diverse fiction, hopefully more public domain fiction that's open, we don't have to have any restrictions, and then just redoing the process and documenting it hopefully leads to better ways to do it in the future. So on to methods. Um, this is my work plan. You can probably tell I'm a humanist. I don't have a, a cool diagram with like all the squares. Uh, so instead I have uh, an outline um, the first step was to identify the volumes that have been added to the HCDL since 2016. This left us with about 1.7 candidate volumes in English language fiction. Or, sorry, English language, excuse me. Um, from there, uh, rather than looking at the raw text itself, um, which we don't think we need to do, we use the Hottie Trust Research Center Extracted Features data set. I'll tell you more about that next slide. Uh, and we use the metadata from the Novel TM data set um, the extracted features are the features, that's the data set um, that we're, we're crunching. The metadata helps us identify subsets of that to train and test. Um, we again modified to look at the volume level. Uh, we have a number of sampling logics that we wanted to test out to see what was most accurate. Uh, and as well, we were benchmarking the statistical models. Uh, part of this work is to then evaluate the results uh, with human review. Uh, and do some any sort of potential machine learning experiments. Uh, at this point, shout out to uh, Daniel Evans and John A. Walsh uh, at Indiana. Daniel Evans at University of Illinois. They've helped us uh, do human annotation, and we'll be joining the project more formally uh, in a forthcoming paper. Uh, from there, uh, since I, I work for a research center for a digital library, we have a practical outcome, which is to uh, eventually deploy this trained classifier on all those volumes to update the total set of English language fiction. So the uh, HCRC extracted features, uh, these are uh, a bag of words data set, one file for every volume in Hottie Trust. Uh, bag of words, oh, I 
probably relatively common, but all the words out of order. Uh, so the, it's transformative, it's fair use, it takes copyright out of the picture. We also have some structural metadata that can be helpful, though we didn't engage much with that on this project. Uh, this is a web browser view. It's a big JSON data set, 17.7, um, well, 17.1 million volumes. We're working on updating that as well. So uh, the first step is to compile our train and test uh, data sets. Uh, we have three different sampling logics. The first here, uh, and I very creatively call them sample one, two, and three. Uh, sample one is just over 10,000 random volumes. We tried to hit at 10,000. We first benchmarked about half of that, had decent results, but we uh, felt like if we could double up the data, we could get even better results. Uh, so 10,000 random volumes matching the distribution of items added to the HTDL since 2016 by decade. Uh, we're trying to look for a 2080 split, fiction, nonfiction. This uh, part in green is kind of uh, confusing. So what I mean is, here is a plot of the decades of the 1.7 million volumes added since 2016. Uh, we wanted our train and test data set to reflect uh, a similar distribution of dates. So if there's uh, 200,000 uh, volumes from 1970, we wanted to wait that decade to have more impact in our training uh, set. So the other two samples, uh, sample two is the, pretty much the same as sample one, so weighted for decade, but incorporating as much of the manually verified fiction that the original novel TM data set uh, set out. So hopefully that has the most rigorous ground truth. Uh, and then sample three, just to see if, uh, if this was required, that the date uh, distribution was required, we looked at a fully even um, data set that had the same number of fiction and nonfiction volumes for every decade represented in the new items since 2016. You'll see uh, our numbers are lower than 10,000 because oftentimes we don't have uh, you know, 53 volumes from 1810 um, and we may not have it from 1680 or whatever. Um, so we did the best we could. Uh, so we have some limitations in our overall data size on the train test sets. Uh, so again, uh, we did a 20, 80, 20% um, uh, train, or sorry, test, excuse me, I did this backwards. 20% test, 80% train of each 10,000 volume set. Um, we also did five-fold cross-validation. You'll see later on some mean F1 scores to try to uh, prevent overfitting. Uh, then after each run for each sample, we have human reviewers evaluate the errors, correct those that are possible. I'll talk about errors next. They're not all correctable. Um, and then we rerun it again. Essentially, we have a fine-tuned model that we then deploy and see how it improves. So in doing uh, the review, we found basically four main types of errors surface. Uh, the first are the best because they're easiest to correct. This is inc incorrect ground truth. Uh, things as simple as the red badge of courage or Wuthering Heights for some reason not being marked as fiction in the metadata. Uh, the next one is, is perhaps the most interesting to uh, humanists. We had a lot of volumes that uh, blur the line of what fiction is. Um, we have memoir, we have biography, we have travel literature. Uh, it's really hard to tell the difference between Robinson Crusoe and Journey of the Discovery of the Source of the Nile unless you're a historian or have plenty of time to dive into these volumes, which I guess, I guess we had. Um, the third kind of error is non-prose fiction. So uh, the Hardy Trust Digital Library kind of has a lot of everything, uh, but it has a lot of drama, a lot of poetry. It has um, novelizations of films, it has film scripts. So we have to exclude all these things that in reality are fiction, but are not what we're interested in. Uh, the last thing, uh, relatively rare, are true errors, uh, places, uh, volumes that just confounded the classifier, uh, and they weren't, generally were not super confident, and they just kind of made a guess that they, the classifier. Uh, there are also a very small number of errors that our reviewers couldn't agree on, that they simply could not trace down, which uh, speaks to the difficulty of this task even for humans. So results. Ah, the dreaded uh, precision recall F1 slide. Um, so we have our three models at the top, logistic regression, SVM, random forest. We use 120 estimators there. Uh, we have each sample here uh, benchmarked for each metric, and then we have the corrected version of that sample as well. Uh, you'll note that uh, sample two, uh, already was, was relatively better than the others, and then once we correct the ground truth here, that's what I mean. Uh, it's only the cases where it was obvious that ground truth was wrong. We made the change in the metadata, and this created um, by far a, a landslide winner for our sample two, the weighted sample with the manually verified ground truth. Uh, there's one uh, small outlier here in recall, which is it's not surprising if we're adjusting ground truth, recall is gonna change. But overall, uh, logistic regression by far the winner, so uh, shout out to prescient uh, Professor Underwood, uh, Patrick Camutis, and Jessica Witte. 
Uh, here's our uh, five-fold mean F1 scores. Again, our sample two corrected wins, but uh, less uh, high scores since where the impact of that corrected ground truth becomes minimized once we shuffle our train and test sets. Uh, but again, uh, sample two, uh, really head and shoulders better. I mean, in this, relatively so, with uh, two to three percent being quite a bit uh, difference but, uh, relative to our samples. Uh, this is just a look into our annotation. And again, uh, just to point out that uh, human annotation was quite complex for this uh, project. We had um, some disagreements on incorrect ground truth. Um, it's a real, real challenge sometimes to investigate these volumes, especially the very old volumes that maybe have no documentation on the web except for an A books link to buy a reprinted version. Um, we also have uh, see error to the the sort of the blur volumes. That was quite a challenge. Probably speaks as well to our bias as reviewers. We have uh, two English scholars and then two uh, information science students. Uh, so we have different perspectives, different expertise. So the takeaways beyond the scores. Uh, so we've we've pretty much shown that this is a very successful way of identifying fiction. Uh, but the takeaways on a more humanistic level are that this is a really hard task, even for humans. Uh, so to appeal to algorithms to uh, solve this for us is a bit naive. It's not going to happen. Uh, how do we classify folklore? Is that fiction or nonfiction? How do we classify a memoir, real or fake? Who can even say what memoir is real or fake? Um, and then how do we classify travel narratives? This is a, a travel narrative called Visit to Freeland that um, was, I believe, wholly made up, but actually inspired real life trips to try to find the places in the narrative. So if it fooled contemporary people, uh, it's probably gonna fool an algorithm now. Um, and to, to think otherwise is a little bit of a techno superiority complex, I think. <laughs> Um, other takeaways that uh, for us, regardless of our statistical model, the sampling logic, the sampling data was by far the most prominent factor. You saw we had pretty uh, relatively similar results across each of our statistical models, but not across our samples. So our, our weighted sample with the most accurate ground truth uh, performed the best. Uh, data publication is a really important factor when it comes to uh, classifying the volumes, but uh, also with a lot of other NLP tasks. Um, I've done some NER work for Native American literature. We're finding the same kind of things there. Uh, topic modeling often quite influenced by uh, data publication, especially when we're looking at OCR texts, and especially when we can describe a relationship between data publication and OCR quality. Uh, the last thing is that, um, maybe this is a little bit mean, but human-produced metadata records, not infallible. Um, pretty good, though, I will say, uh, but there's still room for improvements. Uh, and the, the upside is that, though it's really tedious work, uh, there's a great uh, chance to make large leaps in accuracy if we have the time and the person power to uh, correct ground truth. So some of our next steps, uh, we'll run this classification process over the entire 1.6 million set. Uh, output a new uh, set of English language fiction, uh, as well as a documented data paper and the code, although uh, I'm gonna need some help with that. And there's quite a bit of code, uh, but that's all uh, on the horizon, hopefully. So look out for that from the Hottie Trust Research Center. And that is it, thank you very much. <laughs>